Okay. Hi everyone, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with you today. Uh, I am Brittany Simone Anderson, the co-host of The Work Podcast, and we're also here with Laura Chung. Hello. <laughs> and, and the amazing Anita Kopach, who is the author of uh, the book, Shallow Waters. Um, this is literally uh, what like, the, I don't even know if yummy is the word it was it's it's yummy it's like nurturing it was like nourishing this book um i really 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 loved it and didn't know that i was going to love it this much i mean wow it was really powerful uh, a really powerful story really riveting story um and we have the honor and the pleasure of sitting with you today so we can we can talk your ear off and ask you all the questions i have a couple of burning questions <laughs> like to ask. Thank you so much. Oh, I just got emotional with that. I'm receiving that. Thank you. Such an honor to be here. Well, this is really part two because we already like spoke to you about um, how you came to write this book. Um, and now a year later, I think we interviewed you last year, right? And yeah. you had just um, come out with this book. And there's been this resurgence, not resurgence, but this um, renaissance of Black mermaids with what's happening in our zeitgeist right now. And so how does it feel with, you know, people talking about about Black mermaids and Yemeya kind of like coming out through the ocean? <laughs> like, here I am. It's, it's so amazing because when I was writing this book and a lot of this book felt very channeled from Yemeya. Like it just felt like she was telling me the story and I was just like diligent, like scribe, right? Like writing. And one of the things she told me, she said that my daughters are rising and basically that it's they're, they're going to be seeing me in all different ways. Right. And her daughters are of all people. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm like from the book, you know, but I was, I didn't quite understand, but I just kept, I kept doing it, kept doing the work. And then the first, um, the first time I heard like, and this was right in the beginning of lockdown that I heard that, um, that, that the little mermaid was going to be played by, um, by a black woman, right? Like I was like, I, I heard that and I was like, oh my gosh, this book needs to come out, right? Like that was the first time I heard it. And I was like, this book needs to come out because what it was reminiscent of was me like coloring my mermaids black in my coloring books, right? The little mermaid black in the coloring books and and um the other princesses black. And I was like, oh well well, the original mermaid story is black. So let's tell that story, right? Let's tell the story that is ancient story, right? <laughs> and so I was like, all right, I have to get this out there. And um, so now what she was, what Yemi, I was saying to me that my daughters are rising. It is making sense because now people are wanting to know, oh, wait, there were black mermaids and they're curious and they're, you know, reading more about it. And they're sharing all of these books that have come out lately. Like there's been a lot of black mermaid books that have come out at the same time. Right. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, this definitely is a moment, right. Of this rising of, of not just the black mermaid, but just really seeing black people in fantasy, in myth, and knowing that we have our own um, these these wisdom stories to go back to, and that they're available if we look and you know do a little searching, and hopefully it's going to be more in the forefront. But that's you know I'm really excited about that. Well, you do such a beautiful job also of just describing and um, giving us texture and color and scent. Uh, in the story that it's like I feel and and also 
elevating Africa. So when she's retelling the stories and they're learning about their history and the and the the winged people myth, for example, um, you know, and and then the disconnect that enslaved people may have or may have had to their own culture. It, it just you know, one of my favorite descriptions was when you talk about um, her hair uh, in the river and the way it was like moving with the river, her thick, and I just, it put me there in a way that stories and fantasies haven't. And as, um, you know, a black woman who grew up in America in the eighties and nineties, who didn't see that, like it just, to me, it's, I don't want to get emotional, <laughs> but it just, is it's like what we didn't get as children you know it, it, and it's it fills this void so i'm so excited that there's more discussion around black people in fantasy i love fantasy i read so much fantasy laura is always throwing good book titles my way you know and i grew up reading fantasy and not seeing myself there and then consequently not necessarily feeling like i fit in in those stories and so wow when it comes to life in my head through your words it's magical right i mean i that's how i felt when i was in college and i read octavia butler and i am gonna get emotional because i was like i've always loved fantasy and i didn't realize that i felt like there was a wall between me and the stories i just loved them and then when i read i read wild seed first from Octavia Butler. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like I'm in this and she's magical. And I've always felt very magical, you know? <laughs> like, same, same. <laughs> and so um, it was an emotional moment for me to really um, experience that, experience seeing myself in a, a fantasy novel and um, so I just gobbled her up, you know, like Octavia Butler stuff and um, and writing, writing it. It's I mean, this was particularly intense because it took place in such a painful part of our history with slavery and and such. Um, so it was definitely intense to write, um, which is interesting because if I have a choice, I usually don't like to watch or read anything around on that time because a lot of times I come out feeling like mad, sad, like just so many feelings at the same time. And so when this story came through, I'm like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I relate to that so much, by the way. <laughs> and and I feel like what Shallow Waters does there's a different feeling at the end for me. It's like, there's, it almost feels like there's a healing or there's a, you know, there's something that's a little different from a lot of, a lot of the, the different medias, mediums of storytelling, right. About slavery. But for, for this novel, it was just felt like a healing at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also love that because the writer of this book yourself is a black woman. And I think um, so much of what we learn in American history is just of slavery. And there's so much more richness and there's mythology and folklore um, from the African diaspora that like we don't get to learn about. And um, and you you make the protagonist Yemeya into a hero, like she's on almost like a Odysseus, right? Like um, the, her own hero's journey of finding her power and her magic within herself. Yeah. And the discovery of what that um, like unfold and that unfoldment, right? Of her power within and how everybody saw her as this like, savior before she did yeah 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 uh, absolutely that that also speaks to the effect of of having the world around you tell you that you are powerful you know it, i i think it's something there's something so subtle about that um that understanding of 
the necessity, our necessity to um, to be reminded of our strength and to be reminded of our our virtues and to be reminded of what we offer to the world and have that reflected back to us from our community. Yeah. Um, and so in her finding community, kind of coming upon community and not knowing them and them seeing her, just how powerful that is actually for a human being, for anyone. Yeah. You know, for a so powerful. Because even when we do have that, we can doubt ourselves, right? Like, and it's just like, it was a constant reminder for her. Like there was always someone there to remind her of who she is, right? Mm -hmm. And like, it just had to be like this constant thing. I mean, I have a few favorite characters other than Yemeya, but just like Ozata mm -hmm. knowing just from a deep intuitive knowing, right? Of who she is. Oh, I already knew that she was coming and knew who she was going to be and created a little, you know, wooden um, statue for her. And, um, and so I just think it was really beautiful that she had all of these pillars that would remind her and let her know and not even just remind her, tell her, right? Because she didn't even know at all. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, yeah. It's so important. One of my, my favorite relationships is also her relationship with Tilly. Tilly. I was literally going to ask you that. Mm -hmm. I think you, can I ask you like if you're alluding to some queerness there? Uh, yes, a little. Oh my God, really? <laughs> I was like, I feel some like sexual tension here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and also with the Quaker, um, was it Richard? or Richard. Yeah, yeah. I felt like, Mm, yes, yeah, so <laughs> I felt. I wanted it to be like, you know, in some love stories, it's like, oh, that's the only thing. And I wanted it to be more realistic, where it's like, we, even if we do have these strong feelings, there are these other connections that we make in life, you know? And, and so, um, yes, you picked up right. <laughs> Yes. And I also, you know, wanted to bring in um, the the LGBTQ plus community within like with the with the two spirited um, character and um, with Clementine. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so she was I, I, you know, in the beginning of her meeting Clementine, um, she yeah, I thought she was a man. Mm -hmm. So she spoke and she's like, oh. She's wearing trousers and, you know, like, mm. so, you know, so interesting. And so just because I, I know a lot of times we erase that part of history mm -hmm. and I'm like, why, you know, like, <laughs> well, it's also, sense. it's also just such an important layer to, to our stories as a, as an art, like the, the, the tapestry of like who we are as people. And yes. I, how how disappointing that that richness is left out of so many you know so many tales i love that you would included it in, and as you're you were speaking i was like this is what inclusivity looks like it doesn't have to be some grand gesture that i mean it's a part of who we are yeah and it's so yeah. beautiful yeah yeah exactly it doesn't have to be in your face it's just a part of the story <laughs> <laughs> and it's fantastic <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Oh, I love that you figured that out. I f I can't remember if if it was still in there or if it was taken out by the editors, but I did have wow, it's so funny how I can't remember. I've written so many different versions of this, but it was just a part a uh, like this little moment when when Yemeya and Tilly are just laying on the ground and holding hands mm -hmm. and um just kind of like looking up and just having that little moment, you know. That and it, it's just a beautiful moment of connection. And, you know, even even Tilly, because it was that time, I, I can't even say because it was that time, because it happens nowadays too. But um, you know, I had things in the book where I feel like I may have told you this the last time too, but um just where like little microaggressions where you wouldn't even quite know, you know, because when when Tilly um, and Yemeya were on the run with Moses and she kept calling her Minty, 
even though when even though she said I'm Moses Mm -hmm. like call me Moses and she kept calling her Minty and I remember my editors were like well you know we should change that because she wouldn't do that and I'm like oh yeah she would (laughs) (laughs) that's on purpose that's on purpose you know she might not be meaning to be full out disrespectful but she is being disrespectful you know mm-hmm. just <laughs> Kit, I I so one of my thoughts and one of my greatest takeaways is that this story could should be taught in the classroom you know as a part of our true history because I mean there's nothing really allegorical about it it's pretty straightforward but it it you know it it's a beautiful way to teach a part of of our history, the history of of African people in America, but also weave in some of our culture, things that we don't necessarily get in schools. You know, we we hear a lot of European history and a teeny sliver of, not even really of Asian history, that's not even true. Um, But we get such whitewashed versions of history and ours, the people who inhabit the lands aren't taught. Um, and, you know, with the way things are going, which is really weird in certain parts of the country where they're trying to erase, um, further erase our history, um, we see also the opposite. We see a lot of, of different school districts and places taking up, um, taking interest in, in our wisdom and our stories and, and our true history. And so I wonder if in writing this, you saw, because there's so much historical context, if you saw this taught in schools at all. Yes, it was actually one of my, uh, it was originally written as YA and um, which they always say, don't say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my publishers are like, don't tell people that, but it was, it was originally written for YA because I remember sitting in my classroom and, you know, my mom had told me about slavery. I knew it existed, but when they taught it to me in the classroom, all of a sudden there was just this moment of, oh, I'm not good enough. And when they were teaching it that we were three fifths of a person, you know, like it was just all, all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, like, oh, I'm just not as good as everyone. And like looking around and like feeling that. And I'm like, you know, I I want us to be able to feel, to know that part of history. I don't want to erase that. I don't want to act like it never happened, but to, to learn about it from an empowered place that this is a goddess, right? Like, (laughs) a goddess having this journey and so that was really why I wanted to do it and I and I wrote it like by the time 2020 happened I had already finished writing it I just was like oh it needs to come out now like Uh I I have to get this out now this is a this is perfect timing and um and so I really would love, it is in a few, um, a few schools, a few schools have gotten it, but I would love for it to be in all schools if possible. I don't know if the South is going to have that, but. <laughs> yeah. the They've got some catching up to do <laughs> a little by saw, little. Yeah. The last time I saw you, I was going through like, um, you know, I was, I'm learning about Greek mythology in relation to astrology, because when you learn astrology, you learn about Greek and Roman mythology, but you know, I, you read all of these mythologies growing up and in school, right? And I I was just wondering, um, because we learn just one type of mythology, it kind of shapes our worldview, right? And I was asking you if you, saw Yemeya as Poseidon's counterpart, like whose counterpart, and you said more of like Isis and Aphrodite, but I was arguing that it's more Poseidon because she is the goddess of the sea and Poseidon is the goddess of the um, sea as well. But Yemeya brings in that feminine, that nurturing, because she's the goddess of the ocean and the mother and the children, right? And yeah. if if more people learned her mythology in relation to um, 
how we see this worldview, maybe our worldview would even change that we're not being punished because Poseidon yeah. was fucked up. Yeah. Like he was horrible. Yeah. So like, and when I, when I hear astrologers talking about Neptune, which is the Roman counterpart to Poseidon, it's like, we're being punished like why is this happening to me but if we saw it more of like a nurturing like feminine way maybe we wouldn't see this world that way yeah yeah no it's very true and it's so funny that the day after you told me that i received the this art of yemeya mm -hmm. and she had like the the um trident <laughs> And I was like, okay, that <laughs> might be a sign right there. Wow, what a sign. Right? Right? I was just like, okay, well, there goes my sign right there. She's like, yes. And she's she is um she is a beast, mm -hmm. right? Like there is, she's very um a lot of people who are in within the religion, they are very um specific when they want to call upon her right they don't just call upon her for anything a lot of times they are even scared of her because she's so intense right if you you know she's she will protect her daughters like in very like intense ways we'll say and so a lot of times they will, you know, um, know specifically what they would call upon her for and just keep it in that and ask her to be in that space. But, um, but you know, you think of that with the ocean, you know, she, the ocean can be so calm sometimes and then just so Perfect. devastating yeah. other times. And like, even if we like think of the route of, the hurricanes and, you know, it takes the same route as the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. So. Karma. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. It starts, it's the same route. So it's just, wow. It's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot. And, um, and there's also a lot just with black people and water, you know, how um, there's been all these different reasons for us to be scared of water. And I was doing an interview with this one woman, Dr. Velma Love, who um, is one of my mentors. And she was saying, you know, for her generation, she remembers when, you know, in the South, if a black kid jumped into a public pool, they would literally drain the whole pool. And so that's like what they, <laughs> they were raised with like, oh, you know, so they didn't, even, they weren't even allowed to go to the pools or, or the beaches, you know, um, that's one of the reasons I love Martha's Vineyard so much is because their history is that um, it was the one place where black families were welcomed. And you were allowed to buy land, you were allowed to, you know, hang out on the beach. And so there's a long history of Black people going to the vineyard uh, because of that. Do you see this story really sort of changing our, you know, the current legacy that we live with, with, with our relationship with water? I mean, I feel like we're all trying to heal ourselves. Yeah, I would love that. I feel like, again, it's like a whole a whole bunch of books coming out at the same time. And, and, you know, the little mermaid, there's going to be, you know, every black kid is going to want to know how to swim. Mm -hmm. It's going to want to have a mermaid tail, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. like, and you're going to, you have to know how to swim to use the mermaid tail. You know what I mean? Like, and so I feel like hopefully like this generation and maybe, you know, maybe some older people who don't know how to swim will take that journey because when you're in the water the weight is gone mm -hmm. 
-hmm. right? Like you have this just moment of just being weightless. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things with mermaids that um, the, one of their messages that they try to give us is that, um, you know, when we're, when you're on earth and we're with gravity all the time, it's always like pulling on us, pulling on us down. And then when you're in the water, you just, you know, like, like <laughs> it's just weightless yeah. and um there's such a healing energy especially if you're floating in in um the ocean in salt water I had this moment I went uh, my my family my mom's side of the family's from St. Kitts and I went this summer and I always had this memory in St. Kitts where I would float in the ocean for hours and be at the same place like open my eyes and be in the same place and I'm like I don't think it's a real memory because anywhere else in the world when I float which I love to swim and float in the ocean but when I float I have to pay attention right because I'll be like oh I open my eyes and I'm like so far away from you know <laughs> where the rest of the people are and so this last summer that I went, I did it. I was floating, you know, and I was like, okay, let me pay attention where I am. And I opened my eyes and I was in the same exact place. And I'm like, how is that possible? Because I'm still, you know, like I was still felt like I was moving. And then I just, I just floated. I didn't even pay attention. And I woke up and I was in the same place. And I was like, oh, that memory was real. It was a real memory. I thought I was, I had made it up, you know? And, um, and my mom was there as well. So, and she was there both times, like she was there this time. So there's this thing of, well, I know my mom is watching me, right? Like <laughs> my mom will make sure I don't go too far <laughs> to call out for me, which I knew I had when I was little. And I totally had it this time. Cause she was there sitting on the beach, you know, watching me. So, <laughs> so what you're saying is you can also make webs. <laughs> <laughs> you also have magical power. I'm like, this story is really about me. <laughs> can I can I actually ask you about the webs? Uh so is that a part of the the mythology some of the or you you came up with that? Wow. I don't even know if I came up with and when I tell you she was telling me everything. Wow. She was telling me everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, even the cocooning, because as far as I know, I'm like, oh, mermaids just get out of the water and their legs, they, they turn into legs, right? Mm. And she was like, oh, no, <laughs> it's not that easy. Why would it be that easy? Mm -hmm. True. Why would it be? <laughs> and it's like, you have to cocoon yourself and, you know, like this whole thing. And I was just like, oh, wow. Okay. You know, and that's why, you know, I mean, she was, he, I don't want to tell the whole story, but you know. <laughs> what headspace or like, where do you go when you're channeling, channeling period, but like when you were writing this book, were you like closing your eyes, meditating and then writing? Like, where do you yeah, go? A lot of times. So I had on um, the, the Native American flute choir music it's like a, a pandora station so it played a lot of different um native american flute and then you know i would just sit and wait for like well what what comes next and the the actual ending um didn't come to me until probably a week before Simon and Schuster read the book. Mm -hmm. I had all different types of endings. And each time I was like, this is not the ending, but I don't know what the ending is, right? Like they were okay endings, but for me as a storyteller, the end is like the most important part of a book <laughs> or of a story, like so important because I could be so engaged the whole time. And then the end, I'm like, why why and this is for me is a why ending i'm not going to say you know why it's a why ending but it, there is still the sense of why for me um and and it's very intense but when it came through 
that week, which I didn't even know that Simon and Schuster was going to ha have the book, but I think it was because she didn't want anyone else to have that ending. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. She didn't want anyone else to know what was going to happen. And it came through and, and then I had the opportunity of publishing with Simon and Schuster, like literally right after that. And so, um, oh, yeah, there's just, it, it, it was such a magical journey, such a magical journey. You took us on a journey. I was literally just like pacing and, and just like walking back and forth. Just, I couldn't stop it. It was making my, my partner pretty anxious because it's, there's so many like the plot turns and stuff. And just when you're like, oh, you're like, oh, you know, and, and, and I, I am very vocal. So I was like listening to it and like yelling <laughs> in my apartment. <laughs> it's a really a riveting story though. It, it, it really was, it just, Wow. <laughs> no. And I love that you you mentioned the the um audible because my sister Michelle read it. And um, you know, for me, I was thinking about who did I love like reading stories for me. I knew that I didn't want to read it, I didn't feel called to it. And I was like, oh, I used to love when my mom would read stories, and I'd love when my sister Michelle would read stories to me. And so I just knew my mom was not going to want to do it. Like I did ask her later, I'm like, would you have wanted? And she's like, no, no. She just would have been so annoyed. Like I can't imagine her sitting, you know, with earphones on. And I just don't think she would have liked that. <laughs> and, and my sister, Michelle, was just so brilliant. So she brilliant. was so brilliant, was able to bring so much to the story. And um, <laughs> she was telling me because she was, she had, you know, obviously read it a few times be before, but she said the first time she read it, <laughs> it was, she was ended up like staying up in the bath until like three o'clock in the morning reading it. And she said at the end, she was like, why? And she just yeah. like falling, crying. And she was just like, <laughs> I had the same reaction. <laughs> same. Same. She 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 really did though bring the characters to life. And um I have to tell you that I am someone who is hesitant to listen to fiction on Audible because um I, I found that sometimes the the narr the narrator doesn't allow me to like it's bringing someone else's version kind of of the characters and it, it disrupts my, but I did not, I mean, I felt she took me on a, on a gosh darn journey. <laughs> yes. I love it. I'll tell her that. I'll tell her that. It'll make her so I didn't, happy. I didn't realize it was her until the end. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. And then and it's really fun because she has a very, all of us, all of the sisters has, have a very similar voice. Like we all sound alike. And um, so a lot of times when I was listening to it, there'd be moments where I'd be like, oh my gosh, I thought it was me, <laughs> right? Like, wow, it sounded like me reading it. So that was, that was really special. Um, so we want to honor your time. Um, so just a couple, maybe more questions, but there is this African proverb and I don't know who says it, but um, it's an African proverb um, that says like, until the lion tells his story the the hunter is always the hero and mm -hmm. as a black woman you have always been not maybe always been but in the eyes of the hunter the lion right and so in america um people push their stories on you and like you know you're shaped by how other people perceive you and so when you're tapping into the hero now retelling your stories and re um shaping how other people see you how do you like where do you go to do that because like yes you are at the intersections of race and gender oppression but like then to become this hero like how do you do that yeah oh I don't know why this is making me emotional but um you know you know our community right and so the community is so important because um 
I feel like when I have that at my center, I can do anything. Mm. And so, um, uh, Brittany talked about how important it was, um, to have people recognize who you are and recognize your power and like to have that being what feeds you. And then you could go in and really write from that, that place, because, um, <laughs> recently I figured out that I do freeze right when I'm <laughs> when I'm uncomfortable around white people which I didn't realize that I do um you know I don't want to write from that place I don't feel inspired to write from that place I don't feel inspired to wanting to tell my story and um and so it's so important for me to surround myself well, I'm not a lone wolf, I would say. I have to surround myself with community in order for me to reach my deepest potential in storytelling. Mm -hmm. Well, there's now discussion that the lone wolf, wolf myth is in fact a myth, right? It's it's not really that that lone wolf trope is not necessarily really true to nature. No one is really meant to be a lone wolf. And, and when we are reminded of the importance of community, we can step back, especially coming out of the past few years, you know, I mean, you finished the book, you said in, in 2020, yeah. um, which was like when we all sort of stepped into the space of isolation and just that reminder in written form of how powerful community, you know, is it, it can be, we can begin to undo some of that damage. I mean, the story hits so, so on so many layers, you know, and on so many levels. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Anita. This was such a beautiful conversation. Get shallow waters. <laughs> Get it. And I, I love that, you know, I have the different colors, the blue one. <laughs> That's for paperback. paperback right? This yeah. is the paperback. Yes. Amazing. So. Thank you. Thank you.